Are you ready for more Bible study? Very good. So let me start with a word of prayer and off we go. Our gracious Lord, so here we are again, dependent upon you and your Holy Spirit to work on our minds, on our hearts. And we ask that you give us a sensitive mind, an open heart, and that we can learn today what you want us to learn. And not only for the sake of learning, but for the sake of being more like you, to be more effective tools in your hands so that you can use us to reach others who don't know you yet. And we want to belong to you now and forever and to give all the glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you for coming for the Bible study. A man is walking through a building site and sees uh, another person working hard. So he asks him a question, what are you doing? I am hewing stones. Mm, okay. He walks to another one and asks him, what are you doing? He says, I am earning my livelihood. I have a family, I have three children, I need to feed them. I am earning my livelihood. Mm. Okay. He goes to another one and asks the question, what are you doing? He says, I am building a cathedral. This stone one day will be there in the cathedral. Do you see the difference? The one sees only what they are doing here and now, concentrating on cutting the stone. The other sees a wider picture, his family that needs to be taken care of, and he needs to provide for them, so he's earning his livelihood. But the third one has a bigger perspective. He sees the bigger picture. He sees that one day what he is doing now might be tedious and difficult, will have impact because there will be a part of the beautiful cathedral. Now, if someone asks you, what is the Bible all about? Here's the question. As Jesus used to ask, how do you read? What are you doing? Oh, I am finding a proof text that what we believe is true. Yeah, good. If it's so important for you to be sure that what you believe is true, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God for every proof text. Can you see the cathedral? You know, not all the bricks in the cathedral are equally important. If you take a brick there in that wall and knock out one brick there, it won't look nice, but nothing will happen. It won't have any impact on this building. On the other hand, if you knock that pillar there, let me get my pointer. This pillar here, if you knock down that pillar, this building will be in big trouble. It will have structural problems. Because that pillar is more important. Now, there are many stories in the Bible, but they are not of all of equal importance. Can you see the big picture? Can you see the cathedral? Do you know why the Jews of the first century rejected Jesus? Here is the simple answer. Because they didn't see the cathedral. They were so concerned seeing the Messiah driving out the hatred, the hated Roman soldiers standing on the corner. Because this time they came back home from exile but they are still in exile. Roman army came to them. And they are so concentrating on getting rid of those soldiers that they don't see the big picture. They don't see the cathedral. 
somebody comes to Jesus and says, tell my brother to divide the estate, the property, with me equally. And Jesus says, I am dealing with bigger issues than your family estate. So what are the bigger issues? What is the cathedral? Can I get the PowerPoint, please? The story started in the Garden of Eden, and the and the key text was. By now, you should know this by heart. Genesis three. Nine, Adam, where are you? The key phrase was. Adam, where are you? God is not looking for coordinates into his GPS. God is asking, what has changed in you? Why? Because sin does not change God's relationship with us. It changes our relationship with God. Never forget that. Can I get the PowerPoint, please? The Bible portrays God's relationship with us as unchanging, unfailing, unconditional. There's nothing you can do for God to love you more. Are you there, guys? There's nothing you can do for God to love you more. Somebody should say amen to that. Aren't you great for that? P.S. There's nothing you can do for God to love you less. Because His love is unchanging, unfailing, unconditional. It's agape love. But sin does something to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the PowerPoint. But sin does something to you. It breaks something down within you. Okay, the next part, the next important story, the next column in the cathedral was the Exodus story. The key text is Exodus 3, 7. The location is Egypt. And the key text is, I have heard the cry. God always hears the cry. I am aware of what's going on. It may not see from your perspective, 22nd of June, like that, but I hear the cry. I see the tears. I know what you are in. And I am going to do something about it. And what does he do? He provides rescue and redemption from any sin and any oppression. And then yesterday we came to the next stage of the story. It's the story of Sinai. It's the story of covenant. Now, if you don't read it in the context of the story, you are going to read it as to-do list. That God gets them out of slavery and suddenly there is no quota of bricks to fulfill and they are sitting there, have nothing to do. So God says, let me give you something to do when you have nothing to do. And you are going to perceive God's commandments as something you are supposed to do. We are glad you came to the evangelistic meeting. And now when you are here, let me tell you, this is what you are supposed to do. Let me hit you with the message. No. If you see the context, the story, you understand God wanted them to be What you do is only the result of who you are. And that's why he brought them out of Egypt, to be a new type of community. And the key text was Exodus 7.1, when God says, you will be God to Pharaoh. He says to Moses, you are the message. He's going to listen to you. And of course, once again this morning, you have heard one Carlos Patrick talking about how God wonderfully used Moses. But the important thing is, in the religion of the Bible, God not only speaks to Moses. Moses cannot become a new Pharaoh. So six weeks later, 40 days later, he gathers them all around Sinai, and Moses says to people, prepare to meet your God. Why? Because God wants to meet with them. God was not... 
against them when, they draw, when he drove them out of Eden. He put in place immediately the seed will solve the problem. He speaks to Noah. He speaks to Abraham. He calls him. Why? So that he can congratulate himself. Says, isn't that wonderful? I am God's child. Everybody is lost, but I am God's child. True? What does Genesis 12 say? I have called you so that you are a blessing. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God's call is always a call to be a blessing for somebody else. God calls you because He loves other people. Of course He loves you. If He loves other people, He loves you. But God's call is always a call to be a blessing. And so when He rescued them and redeemed them, it was not that they can have a club and talk forever. Ah, wasn't that wonderful that we have been rescued? So that they become a new type of community. Did you like it when I heard your cry? Yes. It wasn't that wonderful? When we went out of Egypt, it seemed to us like a dream. Waters on the right, waters on the left. And we went through the dry land. Now God says, never forget that story. You know what will be the key word of the Old Testament religion? Remember. Remember your story. Remember the Sabbath. Remember you have been slaves in Egypt. So, the key theological truth is you will be God to Pharaoh. You are the message. The medium is the message. So, the story goes from Garden of Eden to Egypt and from Egypt to Sinai. And it's not only Moses who is the message, it's the whole nation. You are kings and priests, priestly kings and kingly priests. You are a different nation. You are the message. Now, how did the things continue? Notice what it says in Exodus 22. While they are there still in the wilderness, God says to them, Exodus 22, 22, Do not take advantage of, widow, of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. What is that? Remember your story. Remember how it felt when you were oppressed. Did you like it when I heard your cry? Excellent. Now, make sure you don't do that to other people. Now, when you know how it felt, make sure you don't do it to other people. I remember when I was at Newball in 1981, I came as a sponsored student. Euro-Africa Division was sponsoring me, and they wrote me a letter, Daniel, you have this amount of money for each day. You know, they paid for my uh, tuition, they paid for my room and board, and they gave me little money to buy the toothpaste and uh, some books, etc. But every time I needed that money, I had to go to the finance office and ask the business manager, please, could I get my own money? And uh, with graciousness, he would look down upon me and said, okay, here is your money for these two weeks. I made a decision then and there. If I am ever married, if I ever have children, I am not going to make them go through the embarrassing experience asking for something which belongs to them, just because how it felt. God says, and if you oppress a widow or an orphan, and if you treat them in such a way that they cry out to me, then remember, God always hears the cry. Then I will hear their cry, and then I am not on your side anymore, but I am on their side. Listen to this, verse 26. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, make sure you return it by sunset. Why? Why? 
Because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. And remember, in the desert, it's hot during the day, but it's cold, freezing during the night. What else can they sleep in? And listen to this. When they cry out to me, I will hear because I am a compassionate God. And when they cry to me because of how you treat them, it tells me you have forgotten your story. And then I will be on their side, not on your side. And the prophets will come, Amos, Micah, Hosea. Hosea says, we Israelites, we know you. We have the right orthodox beliefs. We have all the right fundamental beliefs. And God says, I hate your beautiful songs with proper music. I hate your orthodox theology. Why? Because if you oppress a widow, if you oppress an orphan, you are not my people. Wow. Why? Because it's all about relationships. It's about how you treat another human being. Remember your story. So, remember, there was one important thing that God told them at Sinai. Exodus 19.5, we read it yesterday. If you obey my commandments. There was an if. With Pharaoh, there was no if. The only if was, if you don't fulfill your quota, these are the consequences. But with God, the story can go two ways. So let's have a look how it went. Let's turn to 1 Kings 10. They got into the promised land. They divided it. And of course, if we had more than four days, it would be interesting to look at the period of Judges, how a pattern is repeated. They have been doing evil things. And then somebody came and oppressed them, but they cried to the Lord, and the Lord sent them a judge who used violence to get rid of the oppressor. And what was the result? After 20 years, they are in another oppression that lasted 80 years. But after a while, they are going to cry to the Lord, and God always hears the cry and send them another deliverer. And so one day they come up with a genius idea. Let's have a king. And so let's be like Philistines. And what kind of king do you want? God said, oh, a tall one. And so when they got Saul, everybody's pleased. Oh, they got a tall one. But it didn't work out well. And so then God found another one that was according to God's heart. One day, he says, I'm going to build a temple. And God says, you can't do that. Why? You have shed too much blood. And Nathan and David have to learn that not everything that God blessed, he agreed with. It's a difficult lesson to learn. Because what God blesses speaks more about him than it speaks about us. And so let's pick up the story in 1 Kings 10. Here is the pinnacle of the history of Israel. After the son of David, Solomon, now Israel becomes a superpower. Now they are a kingdom to be reckoned with. And the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. See, it's capitalized. She heard about this God. And so she came to test him with hard questions. Let me stop there. I have a son who is a philosopher. Now, as you have discovered from uh, the program, I happen to have a doctorate in philosophy. So I have spent more than two weeks studying the area of theology. When he decided that he wants to be a philosopher, his idea was to defend Christianity at, uh, in academic environment to be a professor of philosophy. He went to Nottingham University. Do you know how long I was a partner for him to discuss the philosophical questions? One semester. After one semester, with a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and a doctoral degree in theology, 
I was not a partner for someone in first year of BA in philosophy to discuss the difficult questions he was facing. Notice, unbelievers have hard questions. You have just not discovered it yet because you don't talk to them. But if you rub shoulders with them, if you talk to them, you discover they've got hard questions. But as George McDowell says, unbelievers have hard questions, but we've got good answers. Just remember, those good answers don't come under your pillow when you sleep at night. You will need to spend some time thinking about those hard questions. So let's pick up verse 2. Arriving at Jerusalem with a great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. And she unloaded everything she was curious to know. And listen to this. George, De George McDowell was right. Unbelievers have hard questions, but we've got good answers. Verse 3, and Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the place he had built, the food on his table, the sitting of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, when he, she saw how the servants are dressed, his cupbearers and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. Verse 6, and she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and I saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me, in wisdom and wealth you have far exceeded the report I heard. And then this pagan queen, some theologians, some scholars say she's from Ethiopia, some say she's from contemporary Yemen, you know, the Arabian queen, but most scholars think she's from Ethiopia. This is what the pagan king, queen says. How happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. How happy must be all these servants, all these nations, that they can listen to this wisdom all the time. It reminds me of the days when I was in Russia. You know, I spent two years teaching theology in our seminary in Zaoksky in Russia. I came there in December 1990, two years after the seminary opened. They asked the GC to send them some people who could teach in the school because after 70 years where there was no theological training for our pastors, during the perestroika era, they got the permission to open the seminary. When I was at Newbold in 81, 82, Michael Kulako and Slava Yaruta were there. And Michael Kulako told me that in 1981, Daniel, one day we are going to have a seminary in the Soviet Union and you will come and teach in our seminary. Beloved, that's a gift of faith. Brezhnev was still alive. There was no here of, nobody ever heard about perestroika. And he said in 1981, one day we are going to have a seminary and you are going to teach there. And so when they opened the seminary in 88, the GC said to them, okay, the first two years you can manage with your own resources and we will send you someone for the year three and four so that to teach the students in the higher classes. So I came there in December 1990. And I taught in the morning, I was the academic dean. I was the dean of theology and academic dean of the whole institution. And this was such a marvelous experience for them. They realized we are living through history. Our fathers have prayed about this, but they never had this chance to have a seminary to study theology full time. And so the students were there and many of them were married. And one day I got this delegation in my office. The wives of the married students came to see me and said, we would like to come to the classes as well because our husbands come home and they talk about these things they have learned in the class. They are so excited. And I, we would like to hear it too. We never heard things like this in our lives. And so we'll do it this way. We'll arrange the childcare among ourselves so that a number of us can sit in the classes, would you allow that? And I said, of course, if you, if you can arrange your childcare, you know, the, the children are taken care of, why not? Come and sit in the class. 
And so a number of wives of uh, spouses of the stud theology students were sitting in the class. And one day, one night, we went to bed with my wife, we prayed. And I thought, okay, now we are going to sleep. And suddenly she started laughing and she laughs and laughs and laughs. I said, Vera, what's going on? <laughs> and she says to me, Daniel, imagine one of the wives of the students stopped me on my way on campus today. And she said to me, Vera, you cannot imagine how I envy you. And she looked at her and said, why? What? What's, what's going on? And she said, you have a husband you can talk to about exegesis all the time. <laughs> How happy you must be. You have a husband that you can talk to about exegesis anytime you want to. Yeah, sure. After you taught the whole morning, after you did the administration work in the afternoon, when I come home late night tired, exegesis is the first thing on my mind I want to talk about. But this is what Queen Sheba says. How happy these people must be because they have this source of wisdom in their midst. Oh, they must be overjoyed that every day they can listen to this wisdom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now listen, listen what she says. Praise, verse 9, 1 Kings 10, 9. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. She says to Solomon, and do you know why you sit on that throne? Do you know why you are in that position? Let me tell you. And a pagan queen says to the son of David, the king of Israel, because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. Let me tell you why you are there. You are there because God wants you to be a different type of community. And it's your job, it's your task to make sure it happens. I have never seen anything like this. I have never seen a kingdom where a king treats the subject this way. All the kingdoms are about power and influence and politics. But you are a different type of community. Well, what do you say? Okay, you are somehow quiet this morning. Amen. That's what she thought. Praise the Lord. But imagine a pagan queen says to the king of Israel, and let me remind you why you sit in that position, why you sit on the throne, why God put you in that elevated position to make sure that justice and righteousness is done. And you know what's interesting? This is what Queen of Sheba saw. But the inspired author is going to pull the curtain aside and show you what God saw. So just turn one page before, chapter 9, verse 15. Chapter 9, 1 Kings 9, verse 15, what God saw. Here is the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own place, the supporting terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazer Megiddo and Gezer. Here is the account, and this is the story, yeah, and I translate, here is the account, but we would say, and this is the story of forced labor. Have you heard words forced labor before? Have you heard it before? Oh yes, at the beginning of Exodus, that's how we started. On Tuesday morning, Exodus 1 saw so the Egyptians put slave masters over Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. What's another word for forced labor? Slavery. So Solomon is using slaves. Why? Or oh, to build the Lord's temple. 
Everybody is build, busy building their own house. So if you want to build that house of the Lord, Lord's temple, what's the most effective way to do it? You slaves. Now he is nice enough. He doesn't use Israelites, his own brothers or sisters, to do it. He just uses the pagans, the ones who are supposed to come to Israel and see what a wonderful God they serve. That they serve God who hates slavery. So they use slaves to build the temple of the Lord for the glory of God who hates slavery. Do you see what's going on? In few generations, you can adjust your thinking so much that you rationalize away using slaves for the glory of God, to build the temple for the glory of God who hates slavery. And of course, once you have them, then you can also build your own palace. What is palace? That's where you live. That's about comfort. That's not a house. That's a palace. That's about your own comfort. And of course, if you live in palace, then you are going to have probably, as a king, more than one wife. We'll get to that in a minute. And Solomon and his problems. And the wives say, how can I host the parties for all the other ladies because I have nowhere to host them? So once you build the palace, you have to build also the hanging terraces where your wife can host the parties. The problem is that if you have a palace with hanging terraces, somebody else will come and say, I want to live in that palace. Why should I live in a hut somewhere, in a slum somewhere else? I want to live in that palace. I want to use those hanging terraces as well. So then you need to build the wall around your palace and around your city so that nobody comes and takes your palace away from you. And once you have the wall, actually it's wise not only to let the enemy to get to your city, it's good to keep them at bay. So let me tell you what Hazer, Megiddo, and Gezer are. They are military bases. Do you see what's going on? The queen of Sheba comes and says, and you are sitting on that throne. God put you there because you are to make sure that justice and righteousness reigns. And in a few generations, those who have been oppressed become oppressors. And they use their resources for self-preservation, to build up their own comfort and to protect it. They don't use their resources for evangelism to be the hill on the city on the hill. They use it to build their own comfort zone. They are building the empire using the slaves. The oppressed become oppressors. You know what Passover, what Sabbath, what the religious feasts were all about? Remember. And what happened? Now the other people are crying because they are oppressed. Now Solomon accumulates slaves and became the very thing that his people needed rescue from. The son of David becomes a new pharaoh. He doesn't hear the cry of the oppressed. He causes it now. Every light should be blinking now on our dashboard. Imagine. Now, of course, this happened only to Israelites. That would never happen to us. Remember the Sabbath conferences of early Adventists? They came together. Why? To study the Bible. To learn the truth. Because in a society where everybody ate eggs and a bacon for centuries, they said, but from the next week, we are going to eat cornflakes. In a society where people said at the funeral, oh, don't cry, she is already singing in the heavenly choir. 
they say, no, 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 she's sleeping in the grave. In a society which said, it doesn't matter which day you keep, as long as you keep one, they say, no, 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 it's important to keep the seventh one. The commandment says, but the seventh day, not one day, is the Sabbath of the Lord. From next week, we are keeping the Saturday, not Sunday. They are willing to change. In few generations, very few people study the Bible to learn something new. They just want a confirmation what they believe is always it's true. In few generations, you can rationalize and spend your money on yourself. Interestingly enough, Moses knew that this might happen, so he warned them in Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 17. This is what Moses says in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is preparing them, teaching them how to be special people. One day your situation will change. One day you will not be in desert anymore. You will be in the promised land. You will have stable income. Your life, the level of your comfort will go up. And nothing wrong with that. You don't need to live in London in 2017 like on a Jamaican farm in 1956. That's okay. Don't need to feel guilty about that. Don't need to take a cold shower just because 60 years ago you used to. But this is the important thing, he says. When you enter the land of Lord your God is giving you and you have taken possession of it and settled in it, you will say, let us sing a, set a king over us like all the nations around us. Let's be, be, let's be like everybody else. God says to Samuel, don't cry, don't be sad. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me because God says, I can choose the most charismatically sensitive person to be the next leader. Who decided who is going to be the next judge? The Lord. He appointed the next judge. Now, if you have the kingdom, who is going to be the next king? The firstborn son of the previous king. And you know what will be the result? You read in the book of Kings. And he did evil things in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father did. Because now the next king is not going to be the most sensitive person, the most responsive to the leadings of the spirit. The next king is going to be the one according to the birth line. And God says the problem with the king is nothing is going to be good enough for the king. He will take the best boys to serve in his army, to fight in his wars for his interests. He will take the best girls to fight, to put them into his harem. Have you noticed, uh, I mean, the sermon yesterday night, have you noticed in the Bible, every time David wakes up in the morning and there is an enemy to face him, he is going to ask the Lord, Lord, should I go out and fight with these enemies? He looks into the mirror in the morning and he sees their head is still on the top of his neck and he realizes the head might not be there tonight. So he is scared to go into the war and he asks, Lord, should I go out and fight with them? And when the Lord says, yep, go out, I have given them into your hand, then he goes and fights. Now, interestingly enough, when he takes another wife into his harem, he does not ask, Lord, do I need to take another wife into my harem? I already got 12. Do I need another one? No. And the, uh, Moses says, the problem with kingdom is going to be nothing will be good enough for the king. He will take the best vineyards for himself, the best girls for his harem, best boys. You are in real danger there. So this is what we need to do. Verse 15, be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. By the way, do you understand when Herod heard that the king of the Jews have been born, that he got scared? Do you understand why? Because he is an Edomite. He is not one of their own brothers. He's not a Jew. So he knows he's not a king of Jews. He only bought the title with money from Romans. Because Deuteronomy 17 says, you cannot have a king who is a foreigner. And not only that, 
Listen to this, verse 16. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself to make people to return to, to, return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. So what the king must not do? He must not acquire horses. Secondly, verse 17. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. So how many is many? And the third thing, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. How much is much? All right? And this is how we are going to make sure that this happens. Listen to this. Verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. So as a part of inauguration ceremony, with his own hand, he needs to copy this section from the Torah, from the law, for himself. And why? It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these degrees. Listen, he needs to copy that into his own notepad, into his own notebook, and then he cannot buy a devotional from Stanborough Press his devotional is going to be reading Deuteronomy 17 every day of his life. Why? So that he does not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Because if he does not make this devotional every, doesn't read this devotional reading every morning, soon he's going to think, oh, because I've got 13 wives in my harem, I am better than those who got one. Or oh, because I have this many horses in my stables, I am better than those who have none. And because I have this much uh, gold in my treasures, treasure chests, you know, I am better than those who are poor. And this he and his descendants, thus he and his descendants will reign and for a long time over the kingdom of Israel. So God says, imagine. In medieval period in Europe, when the kings were to sign the document, most of them just put three crosses there. Why? Because they were illiterate. In medieval Europe, the kings could not sign the document because they didn't know how to sign their own name. And here, 1500 before Christ, Moses says, the first job of the future king is to copy with his own hand where are we? Here. Here. To copy this law so that he, he needs to write it with his own hand so that he is engaged mentally with that and then he needs to read it every morning. So here is the summary. What the king must not do, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Secondly, he must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. And three, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. So these are the three things regarding the kingdom king that he must not do. So now let's allow the inspired historian, the inspired writer to pull the curtain away and show us what God has seen. So here we are in chapter 10, verse 14. This is immediately after the story of the queen of Bathsheba. Okay, so... 1 Kings 10, 14. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents. Have you heard this number 666 before? And the weight of the gold that Solomon received every year was 666 tons. And by the way, not including the revenues from merchants and traders from all the Arabian kings and the governors of land. That says, without VAT, okay? He had 666 tons of gold without VAT. And the VAT, all the VAT on top of that. And because his income is only 666 tons of gold, I mean, the guy is becoming a beast. 
That's what the inspired author said. He, on top of that, because he was so poor that he had only income each year, 666 tons of gold, he acquired accumulated horses and chariots. How many? 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also within him in Jerusalem. Why? Because if you have a palace and hanging gardens, then you need to have a good army to protect it because somebody else is going to take it away from you. He's spending his money on protecting his comfort. And not only that, because the poor guy has only income, 666 tons of gold every year. Listen, Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Q. The royal merchants purchased them from Q. And what did they do with them? Why did they need these horses? Oh, they imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. Have you read in the story that horses and chariots? Have you heard that before? Yes, that's how the Egyptians were pursuing Israelites during the Exodus. So now they are accumulating the horses and chariots. And what do they do with them? They bought them for one price, and then they exported them to all the kings of Hittites and the Ara of, of the Arameans. And because this guy is so poor that only he has 666 tons of gold income every year, what does he do? Now, let me tell you, the chariots and horses are the tanks and missiles of the day. What is he doing? He is dealing with weapons. He is selling the weapons. Anybody business-minded in this crowd, in this audience? Can you tell me which business is the best business in the world? Which money, which business brings the most money under the sun? Dealing with arms. This is what the guy is doing. And not only that, I mean, we are dealing here with a superpower, with a beast, with the oppressing beast. And not only that, in chapter 11 we read, the King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from the nations from about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had, how many? 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And what was the result? And his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. This part shows you the systemic evil, the evil which is in the society. But you know what is behind that? These texts show you there is a problem with his heart. There is the individual sin, the lust, the desire. Now, why is this significant? Egypt was the symbolic of the kingdom of darkness, which we are all born into. There is an individual condition that each one of us has to face, the problem of our heart, which pulls us in the wrong direction. But there was another problem with Egypt. There was an overarching systemic evil. Sin was embedded in the society. And God wants to bring rescue and redemption from any oppression. And that's why he says, I am going to have a group of people who are a different type of community. The inspired author pulls the curtain away and tells you this empire is in trouble. This is becoming the kingdom of darkness. Jerusalem is a new Egypt. Pharaoh is a new, sorry, Solomon is the new Pharaoh. His own heart led him astray. The whole culture and the system become oppressive. 
They are building the empire on the back of slaves. They don't care. They don't hear the cry of the people. They are using slaves to build the temple for the glory of the Lord who hates slavery. They are building their palaces, their own comfort. It's a kingdom of comfort. They don't hear the cry anymore. So, what's the lesson? <coughs> Remember Exodus 19.5, if you truly obey. The story can go two ways, either or. Here's the son of David who doesn't hear the cry. Do you understand why in Matthew 15, when a Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus, she says, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples say, send her away. She's getting enough nurse. The disciples don't hear the cry. But Jesus says, what's on your mind? Oh, woman, great is your faith. She's asking, what kind of son of David are you going to be? What kind of Solomon are you? Because you're the first Solomon made us Syrophoenicians his slaves. Are you just like first Solomon? And Jesus treats her differently. He heals her daughter because he hears the cry. In Mark 10, when the blind men come to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Why? Because Solomon did not have mercy. His successors will say, <clears throat> we are going to punish you even more cruelly. We are not going to listen to you. Son of David, true son of David, listens to the blind man. So, here are the three lessons. There's nothing wrong with money and wealth. Abraham was wealthy. Job was wealthy. There are two guys. One has one million pounds. The other has 12 children. Do you know who is happier? The one with million pounds or the one with 12 children? The answer is the one with 12 children because he doesn't want any more. <laughs> Beloved, the problem is not money. You know what is the problem? More, more, more. The problem is when what is driving you is to have more. Now, if nothing is driving you, we are in trouble. Nothing is going to change. But if you allow the more to drive you, you are getting into trouble. It becomes a never-ending, ever-increasing spiral. How much more do you need? How much more hours do you need to be spend at work? How much are you going to take with you when the Lord comes or when you die? When you could say, maybe this is enough and I can use the time I save instead of chasing the holy pound, spending on my family, on my children. Maybe I can use that extra time to do something for my neighbor, to hear the cry, to do something in the local church, to use the talent that God gave me to serve brothers and sisters, to serve those outside. Jesus says, I am among you as the one who serves. The purpose of this is not to make you feel guilty. If you live in Britain in 2017, as Chidi said a few minutes ago, people are willing to risk their lives to live in this country. You don't need to feel guilty for living in Britain in 2017. Praise the Lord for Great Britain. The question is, if what is driving you is to have more and more and more, where is it going to stop? Are you just going to fall on your nose one day and have a heart attack? Because you need more and more and more? That's the problem. Because the guy has 666 tons of gold every year and he needs more. It's not enough. He has all the VAT. He has all the horses, all the chariots, and the poor guy needs to deal with arms. He needs to sell the arms. 
deal with exporting death to other kingdoms to whom he should be testifying about the goodness of his God. Now, of course, Solomon had chariots and horses. They rely on chariots and horses, but we rely on dot, dot, dot. You fill out on our orthodox theology, on our organization, on our system, on our schools, on our programs, you name it. What are the horses and chariots in our lives? What is it that is keeping us? And the scary thought, can you believe that in few generations they can rationalize a way it's okay to use the slaves if it brings glory to the Lord? If it's building the temple of the Lord, then it's okay. It doesn't matter. We can use the slaves. Now, beloved, let me tell you, you can rationalize anything under the sun. P.S. If you are a pastor, you are in a mortal danger. You have a degree in exegesis. No one, no member can tell you, pastor, you are interpreting it wrongly. If you are a pastor, you can rationalize anything under the sun. But you know, they are using the slaves to build the temple of the Lord for the glory of God who hates the slavery. Why? Because the institution became more important than the people. They don't hear the cry of the slaves because they are building the temple of the Lord. Is it possible that institutions, that forms, that working policy becomes more important than people? Is it possible that it could happen again, that history could repeat itself, and it happened not only to Solomon, but it can happen to us, that saving institutions is more important? That's why I thought that if today we have the same temperature as we did yesterday, I am going to come and preach without the tie. <laughs> but because it's colder and rainy today, you know, there are some people who believe that if the preacher has the tie, the Holy Spirit can work better on the minds of the audience. <laughs> Where in the inspired writings did you get that? It's part of the culture, it's part of the tradition. Is it possible that the tradition became more important? than anything else. So, here is the story. Story of Jerusalem. It can go two, it could go two ways. If you obey, you will be a special people. You will be a city on the hill and the people will come and will see what special things God is doing. And some of it happened. The reign of David and Solomon is the pinnacle in the history of Israel. But also the inspired author pulls the curtain away and shows this kingdom has serious problems. From now on, it will only go down the hill. Why? Because they want more. They rely on, on horses and chariots. And the forms and institutions are more important for them than the people. So let me conclude. The location is Jerusalem. The key text is 1 Kings 10, 9, where the phrase is, God has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And the key theological truth is forced labor, using slaves for the glory of God. What are they doing? They are building an empire of comfort and indifference. They don't hear the cry. The important thing is that I have a nice life. Everything else doesn't matter. Is that the end of the story? Come back tomorrow, 11.45. We will see how the story continues. What does God do when he who is looking for a body gets a body that doesn't represent him, that stands for something else that, he, that is important to him? What will be the outcome? Come back tomorrow. Now stand up, pray, and we'll go to get ready for your buses. Imagine if God had a people like that, if God had a group of people like that who are committed 
We are going to hear the cry. We are going to care about people more than anything else. Imagine what impact that would make in South England Conference. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we pray that you rescue us from our indifference in whatever form and shape it takes. We are overwhelmed with the complexity of the world in which we live, and we realize that there is no simple answer, simple solution for each one of us. And those who are in certain positions in the society need to live a certain lifestyle to have the impact on those around them. And those of us who are in a different position need to have a different lifestyle to be witnesses to those surrounding us. But we pray, help us to see the one step that each one of us needs to make to be a blessing to someone else. Help us to be the type of people, the type of community you want us to be in 2017 in south of England. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.